Hello, everybody. Recording live from somewhere. This is Zach Couples with episode number 79 of the Movement Debrief. And tonight, folks, is going to be one of those that is just awesome. Just flat out awesome. We're going to talk about elevating the heels. Why would you do such a desperately thing on the squat? Stay tuned. We're going to talk about the pelvic floor. Why am I coaching the pelvic floor a certain way? What is a kegel? Are you kegling now, Zach? I'll let you know. And last but not least, we're going to talk about identifying with medical labels. What do you do with those people who their livelihood, their purpose is their condition? These are the questions that I'm going to answer tonight, and they have been asked from the people, answered for the people by this people right here, Fam Recognized Fam. Without further ado, let's debrief, shall we? The first question comes from Lucy. And Lucy asks, Que pasa, amigo? Why would you have someone squat with their heels elevated? Is it safe to load? Lucy, unbelievable question. Let me do my darndest to answer that question for you. So, why would you squat with the heels elevated? There's two reasons why I would squat someone with the heels elevated. The first reason is maybe they lack ankle dorsiflexion. With a squat, the goal of the squat should be to have the pelvis fall into a posterior orientation or sacral counter-nutation to achieve depth and then ascend out of that. From a respiratory perspective, it's pelvic inhalation and pelvic exhalation. This on the way down, the narrowing of the infracubic angle, the widening of it on the way up. Sacral counter nutation on the way down, sacral nutation on the way up. You can use heel elevation as a regression if someone lacks ankle mobility. For example, if someone, for whatever reason, has decided to shift their center of mass forward, which is going to anteriorly orient the pelvis, the plantar flexors are going to be more concentrically oriented. Thus, you'll have an ankle dorsiflexion limitation in many cases. If I elevate the heels, I don't have to push into that end range. Thus, it allows me to focus more on the pelvic component of the squat to achieve depth. Also, many times, if you shift someone just a little bit forward, it can act as a, as a uh, proprioceptive feedback to allow them to actually shift their body weight back. Another example of this is a lot of the stuff, uh, the RNT, reactive neuromuscular training stuff that the FMS uses, or as we like to call it, PNF, where if someone is shifting their center of weight over to the right-hand side, you push them into the mistake so they overreact and shift back to the opposite direction. You can apply the same principle with the heel elevation. If someone's center of mass has shifted forward or anteriorly, if I push them even further forward by elevating the heels, that may cause them to counteract that center of mass shift by shifting their weight back, which again is what we're trying to drive when we're getting someone to perform a squat. I need that posterior weight shift to create the sacral counter mutation necessary to achieve depth. Those would be two incredibly useful reasons why you might squat someone or perform any activity where ankle dorsiflexion or even the ability to shift the weight back is a rate limiting step. I use that liberally with people. Now some people out there might make the argument, Zach, this is just putting a band-aid on the real problem or this is just a crutch. I thoroughly disagree. Even if we've gotten someone to squat with full depth without any issues, I still think that heels elevated can be useful from a loading perspective as well. What is the goal? You have to ask yourself. If I'm using a squat-based activity to load the quads, glutes, hamstrings, do I really want my limiting step to be ankle dorsiflexion in that case, or the ability to control the pelvis when I'm reaching those end ranges of ankle mobility? Probably not. Or what if you have someone who, when they get to the bottom of the squat, they, they flatten their feet to a high degree? 
How is that going to be effective for that person to generate force out of the bottom if they're trying to do so from a platform that's essentially a, a pancake? They can't generate a good tension effectively because they don't have that stable platform of, the, of a uh, arched foot. Many times, if you elevate the heel, you eliminate that as a potential limiting factor to moving heavy loads on a squat. If you don't use heel elevation in either of those cases, you're likely leaving pounds on the bar. If you're leaving pounds on the bar, you're probably not loading the lower extremity effectively. You're probably not going to get changes in hypertrophy that you're looking for. You're probably not going to get changes in force production. Is that going to transfer to other tasks where the foot is flat, maybe in sport? Maybe not. But I don't think that that's why you're programming a squat. I don't think that many of the things that we do in the gym are a pure transfer over to another task. The forces are just so much higher. Every time you sprint and you step within a sprint, you put nine times your body weight of force through the lower extremity. What move is going to do that in the gym? Certainly not a squat. So if your goal is loading the lower extremity and you're using the squat as an intervention for that, I'm all for elevating the heels. And I don't think that you're going to uh, miss anything. I don't think you're going to put too much stress and strain on the knees, especially if you're controlling for heel position. In fact, it would probably be helpful because you're not, you're, you're eliminating the foot as a potential limiter to someone squatting effectively. So to summarize this great question, Lucy, would you have someone squat with the heels elevated? Yes. If someone has an ankle dorsiflexion limitation, or if I'm trying to control or teach that initial sacral counternutation of the squat, it's a great regression. It's a great way for them to learn how to push their knees forward without going into the end range of motion, and it allows for the focus to be at the pelvis. If I'm looking at things on the loading side, I also think squatting with the heels elevated is incredibly useful because it eliminates compensatory activity at the feet. It allows you to focus predominantly on loading of the lower extremity, which is the intent of a loaded squat. Lucy, unbelievable question. The next question comes from my boy, Michael Savage, coming soon to a theater near you. Hi, Zach. I don't know you well enough to call you Z-Dog, but you most certainly can. You have my blessing. I've noticed that you are suggesting a butt cheek squeeze on the inhale and relaxation on the exhale. This seems counterintuitive based on my understanding. I thought we would want a relaxed pelvic diaphragm on the inhale to receive the pressure coming down from the diaphragm. This would mean we keggle up on the exhale and that would help drag pressure back up into the diaphragm. This would follow the piston effect that we commonly use. Can I, can I elaborate on why you're utilizing this sequence? And even more so, the thought process and underlying principles that allowed you to come to this conclusion. Michael Savage, rated PG-13. Very good question. So, after uh, doing some work with, with Daddy O Pops, Bill Hartman, if you don't know him, crying out loud, I've linked him in the show notes a bazillion times, I'll do it again. Um, following the squat mechanics that we just talked about, actually, on the way down, or during an inhalation, the sacrum should counter nutate, the innominate should anteriorly rotate. During exhalation, the reverse should happen. The sacrum should nutate, and the pelvi, or the innominate, should posteriorly rotate. This allows for the pelvic floor to descend and catch the goods, and then it pushes them up on the exhale. So then why would I coach the butt cheek squeeze on the inhale? Well, clarification, it's actually not a squeeze of the butt cheeks. Because if I'm squeezing the butt cheeks, what likely is going to happen is you're going to drive external rotation of femurs and create a translation forward of the pelvis based on the glute max activity. No. Instead, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to contract the external anal sphincter. The external anal, sphinc anal sphincter attaches to the coccyx. So if I think about holding in gas as opposed to holding my cheeks tight, since the external anal, anal, anal sphincter attaches to the coccyx, you can create sacral counter 
That's associated with inhalation in the respiratory cycle. That's different than a Kegel. You can section off the pelvic floor to an anterior pelvic floor and a posterior pelvic floor. What I'm discussing involves more the posterior pelvic floor. You can separate those two things. A Kegel is a contraction more so of the anterior pelvic floor. Because when you do that, when you hold off P, that in fact does create the pelvic floor ascending because it has to contract. That's different than holding in gas. If you don't believe me, next time you got to hold in gas, try contracting your pelvic floor and holding in your pee. See how well that works out. In fact, you might want to do it when you go meet the parents for the first time. On the flip side, if you try holding in gas when you got to go take a leak, eh, you might pee your pants, even though that is what the cool kids do. Hashtag Billy Madison, what you going to do about it? So there is a difference between those two things. During inhalation, I need that external anal sphincter to contract to create the counter-nutation. The anterior pelvic floor ought to relax, so you don't want to kegel during that. That's what allows the pelvic floor to descend. I flip-flop that during exhalation. I need the external anal sphincter to relax. I need the anterior pelvic floor to contract to ascend which would allow the goods to push upward, which would allow the diaphragm to ascend and air to evacuate. You could justify utilizing a Kegel during the exhalation. I typically don't. The reason why is because if you look at, uh, I think it was Hodges, I'll have to find the research article, but I'll, uh, don't worry, don't worry, I'll link, I'll link it in the show notes. But if you, Exhale, there's been some research out there showing that without cueing a Kegel, you do get some pelvic floor activity as long as the abdominals are contracting. Those two things work hand in hand. Why do I cue then the uh, taco squeeze, as I like to call it, or the hold in a fart during the inhale though? That seems kind of counterintuitive, right? If I'm not doing it during the exhale, why would I do uh, some type of uh, holding in gas during the inhale? And the reason is, is because it seems to get more of a response during the inhalation in the upper thorax. If I drive anywhere along the axial skeleton, inhalation mechanics, which sacral counter-nutation, you know, ought to have posterior thorax expansion, it seems to have a summative effect. That's really the only reason why I use that during inhalation. And it's not during every activity. If my goal is to drive spinal inhalation very early on because someone is limited in that, how would I check if that's limited? If they have limitations in hip extension, if they have limitations in ER or horizontal abduction, it's a good thing to utilize. That's typically when I go to that. Am I doing it in a squat? Not if it's loaded, maybe in the early phases of things. But you have to think about what your goal is and what you're trying to achieve and when you would use it. So, to summarize that wonderful question, Michael Savage made it PG-13. There's a difference between the anterior and posterior pelvic floor. The posterior pelvic floor is associated with inhalation. You need the external anal sphincter to create sacral counter-nutation. That's where holding in gas is useful. The anterior aspect of the pelvic floor is more useful during exhalation. That's where a Kegel could be effective because it would create that pelvic floor ascension necessary to shift the goods and the guts upward, which allows for air to evacuate, creating the piston effect that you so mentioned. Michael Savage, rated PG-13, unbelievable question. Before I dive into the last question, if you want to know how to apply those two concepts with your people, or see how this, this stuff that I'm talking about, the sacral counter-nutation as well as the squatting, is part of a much bigger and more comprehensive model, then I have a solution for you. It's called Human Matrix, and it is coming your way this year. We've got quite a few locations in the books. May 18th and 19th, the early bird is ending this month on April 19th. We're in San Antonio, Texas. That one is confirmed. It is filling up, folks. You don't want to be the ones missing out. I also have another one that's filling up big time. June 8th and 9th in New York, New York, New York City. That is uh, June 8th and 9th. It's at Hype Gym. That's Pat Davidson's place. You definitely want to come check that one out. We also have 
other people matrices happening August 3rd and 4th in Cincinnati. I have August 24th and 25th in Vancouver, British Columbia. I also have September 21st and 22nd in Raleigh, North Carolina, October 5th and 6th in Boston, and last but not least, December 7th and 8th in Orlando, Florida. So please, I would love to have you attend, I'd love to meet you in person, so we can hash this stuff out and show how it applies to the beautiful, sexy, outstanding people that you work with. The last question comes from my man, Alex, and Alex types. Finally, with clients who have been given medical labels and, became, or, and become part of their identity, that they wear it like a badge of honor or toughness, does your approach to education change or just your expectations of progress? Alex, this is a super interesting question and a really tough one, so I'm going to do my best answering this. Um, I thought a lot about this one. And I, I just got back from Costa Rica. Uh, that's why I, there wasn't much content on last month. Stay tuned. I got some good stories about that. Um, but I was listening to Brian Walsh speak the first week, which, uh, man, that guy is on some other shit. I will link him in the show notes. He's an incredible, incredible functional medicine practitioner. I'm going to be taking his course in Phoenix in uh, May. So I'm really excited to learn more from him. But... Uh, one of the things he mentioned that cells, he was talking about cells, and one big thing that cells have is purpose. All cells have a purpose. It is when cells lack a purpose that problems ensue. Because we are the summation of our cells. One of the big things that we need to sustain life, and this has been shown regardless of if you have social connection, which is probably number two. Purpose is number one. If you have a mission, if you have a goal in life, if you have a purpose, you're going to be doing some big things. When I look at the people you're talking about, Alex, the people who've taken their medical condition, and I, I have a guy who I worked with when I was in California who embodied this. He was a he, was, he had this rare kidney disease where his kidneys were the size of footballs and that was going to lead to his untimely demise. Um, these individuals have developed that as their purpose. That is their goal in life. Their mission is their disease. I worked with a patient too who had these crazy headaches who has seen, I mean, countless practitioners. And her purpose in life was to take care of her headaches. So I have to wonder with people who have this, where they've taken their medical condition and made it who they are, if you somehow take that away from them, do you take away their purpose? Do you take away what brings meaning in their life? And that's a scary thought for me. Um, I, I wonder if perhaps they would have more negative consequences by doing that. I don't know if we have the skill set to do that. But I think that there are much larger problems at play in this case. So I think for these people, what you have to do in the long run is you have to shift their purpose to something else. Now, is that within your skill set? I don't know. Is it in a psychologist's skill set? Absolutely. So maybe your first line of defense might be a psych referral for those types of people if they're open to that. Otherwise, what I seek to do from an educational perspective with these people is find ways that I can empower them or give them a locus of control or even hope. If they've used whatever medical label is of their identity, I'm going to talk to them a lot about what variables you can control. Maybe my man who's got the football sized kidneys can't control that disease. But what he can control is his ability to move, he can control his sleep, he can control his nutrition, he can control all these things, and that could have a potential positive influence on his condition. For the woman who had the, the headaches, same thing. Maybe her life mission is her headaches, and that's her purpose. So what can I do to support her along her mission that may favorably impact that? Think about being supportive in this case, not necessarily trying to take away that medical label or their ownership of that label. Now, that 
leads to the next question, does having this identification or purpose of their medical label, is that a major rate limiting step to progress with you? If that's the case, are there maladaptive beliefs in place that are the rate limiting step in this case? So maybe you have someone who their back is their livelihood and they've got disc bulges from L1 all the way down to L5. Um, they have the worst MRI that this physician has ever seen, so da 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 da. That might be someone who might respond, if they're open to it, to a lot of therapeutic neuroscience education. With those types of individuals, or anyone who needs pain education, I use a, a uh, intervention-based model. So if someone has belief X, and we've decided that that belief is the rate limiting step to them completing more tasks in the rehab realm, I'm going to apply some educational intervention to eliminate that as a belief system. Maybe they still have their purpose as taking care of their back, but we've at least eliminated a maladaptive component to that purpose. So to summarize, this great question, Alex, is if the person has a purpose, you can't take purpose away from them. You can only replace it with a new, more important purpose. Maybe that's out of your scope. What you should do instead is support them along that way, eliminate any maladaptive beliefs they may have, and facilitate the healthy behaviors that are within your skill set, which are ultimately going to help them get better, even if they're um, even if their purpose is still whatever their medical condition or their medical label is. Alex, great question, and I think that that's a great stopping point for us tonight. It's good to be back. Um, I'm hoping to keep the train going after a nice needed, a much needed month off. Um, so we got some good stuff in the pipeline. If you want to learn more though, here's where you can find me. I would just go to zackcouples.com. There you can subscribe to my email newsletter. You'll get almost five hours of free talks on pain and breathing. You'll get a free acute to chronic workload calculator. You're gonna get the latest and greatest on the internet every Friday, and you are going to get exclusive stuff related to content I'm going to be producing later on. Once you've done that, if you want even more, I offer three services for your, for your benefit. The first service would be a movement consultation. Maybe a toy and you're not moving as well as you'd like to, or maybe you're having a hard time squatting, you're unsure what to do, or hey, maybe you want to get better depth at your squat, or when you squat it hurts and you've ruled out the big bad stuff. Well then, let me help you restore your movement capabilities because maybe that's all you need to get those goals. If you want to learn how to do that with your people, I also offer mentoring. We will meet on a periodic basis in person. It's not going to be a Q&A. It's going to be a discussion between the two of us to lead you towards applying these concepts to the people that you are, are relevant to your job and your, your purpose. We also offer training online. If you want to, okay, yeah, Zach, I got it. I can squat, but I want to get mega gains or I want to lose weight or I'm post rehab and I'm unsure when to start the loading process. I can help you with that. What we'll do is we'll go through a movement consultation. I will design a program specifically tailored to whatever movement limitations you may have to help complement your, uh, your ability to improve your movement capabilities as well as your fitness levels. So that's what I have to offer from services. If you want to learn more beyond that, I also have a show on iTunes and Stitcher called The Zach Couple Show because guess what folks? You want to sign up for that? There's 78 other debriefs. Do you really want to look at me for this long? I don't blame you if you don't want to, but you can listen to me on iTunes at the Zach Couple Show. After that, find me on social media. You can find me on Facebook, forward slash Z Couples. The Twitter handle is at Z Couples. The Instagram baby is Zach Z-A-C, Couples C-U-P-B-L-E-S. And if you want a bunch of wild and crazy activities to perform with your people, search Zach Couples on YouTube, and you ought to be in business. Thank you so much for tuning in tonight. It's been wonderful to be back and see all of you beautiful, sexy, outstanding people. I want you to keep it real, but not to the extent where things go wrong. Stay hungry, stay learning, stay moving, and I'll see you next time. Deuces.